Well, here we are right at the edge of the intertidal section of Heron Island. Behind us here is the island, and as we stretch out towards that line in the distance, that's the reef crest where we start to uh, see the oceanic waters meeting Heron Island. Now, this stretch, the intertidal part, and we're at low tide here, is a really interesting part of the biology of reefs. So we'll walk out towards that, that reef crest and we'll have a look at those different zones. Well, we're now just a little way into the intertidal section. It's, it's an area that's still quite close to the island and it is not circulating at low tide with the rest of the ocean and that has some problems. Uh, temperatures can get very, very warm in this part of, of, of the intertidal section. Uh, oxygen levels can get very, very high as well. And at night time, if you have low tide, uh, because there's no photosynthesis, you can have a lot of respiration and CO2 can, can get to a thousand parts or more. But despite all those challenges in this rather harsh environment, you still have a lot of organisms living. For example, we've got sea cucumbers like this one here, this is Holothuria atra, and it's uh, an organism which is really sort of exploiting the detritus and feeding off the gravel. And so what it does is it will ingest sand, clean it of the detrital material, and then spew the sand out the back. And so there's one of those more or less every square metre, and they're playing an important ecological role. One of the other organisms that's very common here in these somewhat harsh environments close to the island are the, the seaweeds or macroalgae and we've got a range of different types. Uh, we've got turbinaria here which is a brown alga that's uh, quite fleshy and tough. Uh, we've also got uh, algae like pedina which has very broad leaves and we've got sagassum and a whole range of other ones. This is a thing called calerpa it's uh, sort of a, a designed to go out and produce holdfasts in the sand and it will try to populate the surface of the sand. These sometimes get mistaken for roots, but they're not true roots. They don't have a vascular system. But you can see this one is extending over time. This is the growing edge right there. So now, some of the other algae are quite interesting, like this one here, Chlorodesmus. Um, which is bright green, it's a green alga, and one of the reasons it's able to persist in these environments is that it's actually slightly toxic to, uh, to anyone who tries to, to graze on it. What's fascinating about this algae is that it often has little creatures that live in amongst the, the, uh, the, the um, plant, uh, getting protection from the fact that it's uh, a slightly poisonous uh, place. Um, one of the other green algae that's interesting um, is uh, it's a, an alga called Halameda. This particular alga is like corals and can actually put down calcium carbonate. And in some places this can build up to be a very significant part of the ecosystem. It's quite common here, but in some deeper environments it can actually be the most significant producer of, of sands. So it's producing calcium carbonate sands. So it's a very interesting organism. So there's a lot of life going on here, and there are corals. Um, there's this particular coral here, which is known as Montipora, and it likes to live in these back reef areas. And when you take it to the laboratory, it's quite tough in terms of its temperature tolerance, which makes sense given it's specialising in an environment that gets rather hot when you have low tide in the middle of the day. So if we want to see more corals, we've got to get to more coral friendly environments. So we're going to walk about halfway to the reef crest and have a look at what we get there. Sea cucumbers belong to the phylum Echinodermata and there are other types of echinoderms out there. One of the other prominent types of echinoderms are the starfish. And these creatures feed by moving across the sand. When they find a prey item or a bit of detritus, They'll exude their stomach and externally digest those prey or detrital it uh, items uh, the way they get their nutrition. And so uh, if I put him back down here, he'll probably slowly move off and try and find a prey item or at least get away from us. 
There are many quite interesting creatures here in the intertidal section and what we have here is an epaulette shark. Now it's a bottom dwelling shark, it only grows to about this big, but it will spend its time in the intertidal area moving across the bottom, it's just about to take off right now, and it'll find invertebrates. And of course it's got lots of places to hide if uh, a predator comes. So at high tide this little guy will probably hide underneath a small cave or, or rock. But you can see he's quite, uh, quite camouflaged. You can see he's using his fins to sort of push himself along. And off he goes. And he's actually going to hide from us. I think we gave him reason to seek shelter. But sharks of course are magnificent creatures which are under enormous pressure worldwide. And the cousins of this guy the pelagic sharks are, are losing numbers uh, dramatically as people overfish them for products like shark fin. And it's only when you have sanctuaries like Heron Island do you preserve sharks. And that's one of the real goals of conservation is to make sure that these important creatures don't disappear from our planet. So there are a lot of creatures that are in amongst the boulders and the nooks and crannies in the intertidal region. And here we have a moray eel which is a voracious predator in these environments. This uh, little guy would be hunting through the branches of the dead and living coral, looking for prey, small fish, maybe invertebrates. And certainly uh, you have to be careful in putting your hands in any of these holes because these guys can bite quite nastily. So Halometer is one of these green algae that are able to uh, precipitate calcium carbonate within their tissues and when you actually look at these little blades you can see calcium carbonate crystals inside the the fronds and these organisms can often build up to a point in some parts of, of coral reef ecosystems where they actually provide a lot of the sand that you have in places like this just all those little bits of calcium carbonate that have been precipitated using photosynthesis that become the sand of of lagoons like this one here on Heron Island. Here's a magnificent sea star. This is a starfish called Linkia and it's this magnificent cobalt blue colour and uh, it like the other starfish will um, extrude its stomach, uh, undergo digestion outside the, the body so it's external digestion and it's also uh, a scavenger on coral reefs. Well we've come some way out towards the reef crest, we've still got a way to go. We've left the hostile conditions that are close to the island. We're starting to see patches of branching corals. We just saw some massives over there. And all in all, we're getting conditions that are more hospitable to corals. So let's go and see those as we get out to the reef crest. As we've walked out from the island, we've seen a large number of patches of sediment like this one here. And uh, it's sometimes uh, forgotten in the big equation of coral reefs, but in fact there's a lot going on here. For example, when I look down at the surface here, there's a green fuzz, which is actually indicative of diatoms, cyanobacteria and other organisms which are undergoing photosynthesis, and in the case of cyanobacteria, are fixing the nitrogen in the air and creating inorganic nutrients which are so important to coral reefs. So if I look around here, I can see sea cucumbers that are digesting a lot of that material. I see little burrows, which are crustacea uh, and, and worms and, and other invertebrates who are all working within this ecosystem to essentially maintain the water quality of coral reefs. Well, we're now just behind the reef crest in an area known as the back reef, and it's a great place for corals to grow, as you can see. All around me are branching corals, there's encrusting corals, there's massive corals of all different species. And in addition to the corals, there's a whole bunch of life here. So this is because the conditions here are much better than those inshore. And what we're going to do next is go towards the ocean, up onto the reef crest, where the platform reef then descends down the reef slope into the depths. This is the reef crest. And it's the outermost part of the Heron Island platform reef. And in fact, I can walk with just ankle deep water several kilometers around, if the tides permitted, around the atoll. 
And it's an interesting area for a number of reasons. The first is that it takes the impact of waves and actually protects a lot of the more delicate ecosystems shoreward. So there's a real role here in terms of coastal protection. The other bit is that, and this is obviously related to the fact that it uh, is taking the pounding of storms, is that there is a lot of broken coral fragments. Now these broken coral fragments are stitched together, glued together, by algae known as red coralline algae. And over time this becomes sort of solidified uh, and makes it a much greater barrier to these waves as they come here. Now, if I'm to go further from here, I start to descend down the side of the platform reef and the depth will get deeper, light will become less available until I get down to the sandy areas between the reefs where the coral runs out and the great sandy uh, expanses begin. This part of the platform reef, the reef crest, is an important environment for water quality as well. If you can imagine as water is pushed in as the tide comes in again, um, a lot of these surfaces have uh, nitrifying bacteria associated with them. So there's a couple of studies that have shown that there's a very significant input um, of in inorganic nutrients which are so vital to coral reefs as water passes across these reef crest environments. And if we look down, we can see that there is a really rich flora and fauna on these gravel bits. And in fact, there's lots and lots of uh, cyanobacteria. There's also, see we've got a lot here, just covering this fragment. And this provides almost like a biological filter that's really benefiting coral reefs. So it's not only protection from storms, but this region is also important for uh, providing some of the nutrients that you need for photosynthesis and primary productivity. One of those interesting creatures that likes reef crest environments uh, are the giant clams. And we have one sitting right in front of us here, a species known as Tridacta maxima. And giant clams are interesting for a number of reasons. They're the fastest growing uh, bivalve on the planet. Uh, and the second is that they're actually symbiotic in the same way that corals are with dinoflagellates. So this particular clam has these beautiful colours, uh, but there's an overall brown colour. And if you were to look into the tissues, you'd see the tiny uh, dinoflagellate algae from the genus Symbiodinium populating its tissues. And so that's probably the reason why it's the fastest growing bivalve, in that it can trap the energy of the sun as well as filter feed, and thereby get lots and lots of energy to grow very rapidly. Now to understand the final part of this reef, we're going to have to go back to the research station and get our scuba gear so that we can go off the edge here and explore how the reef changes as we go down the side of the platform reefs.